Hi there. So I had to create a, a name for this topic, and since it was an entrepreneurship summit, I said, well, we'll call it career entrepreneurship. Because while this may not feel like it's a topic that fits when we're talking about startups, I actually think there is a very strong link about how you think about your career, and how you think about leadership, and how you think about building a business. So let's talk about careers. Um, when they asked me to come here, and it usually comes out of a conversation like, my, what an interesting career you've had. And I'm insecure, so I usually think, does that mean it's wrong? Is it, is it, am I schizophrenic? Why have I had all these different jobs? I said, no, there is something to this pattern that I've experienced, and I think it's instructive. Because I will posit that a career is a business, and you are the CEO of that business. You are the entrepreneur in how you manage it. And that there's more of an expediency for this right now because the world is changing faster than ever. I call it a second industrial revolution. And just like over 100 years ago, the pace of change is dramatic. We've seen what technology can do. And it turns out that's putting new pressure for new kinds of leadership that can deal with changing environments. And that's the kind of career I want to talk about. So it's 3.45. I think we all know what an entrepreneur is, but it never hurts to have a definition. Uh, and the key point is taking risk for a business or an enterprise but you can be that enterprise. So I went one step further, and good old Wikipedia had a definition for an entrepreneurial leader. And a bunch of words jumped out, um, being proactive, proactive behavior, optimizing risk, taking responsibility in a dynamic environment. So if you take the word organization out and just put your career in there, you start to think about what are you doing to think about your career while you're waiting to be lucky, as Robert Franks takes us. Sometimes you might not get lucky, so you might have to do something to increase your odds of good luck. So what about me? Um, I cannot possibly take you through all of my jobs. There's been a few, and you'll have to go on LinkedIn if you want to see them all. But I think about a series of serendipitous events because I do believe there's a lot of luck involved, and that serendipity, that, that chance of something good could come out of this. So how did I get from leveraging a French Horn Scholarship to the University of North Carolina into a series of different roles in different countries and strategy and planning into being the CEO of a big data analytics company for recruiters. There is absolutely nothing that connects these things at first glance. It's only in the retelling of the story that there starts to be kind of an interesting pattern of leverage points and leveraging one skill to the next skill to the next skill. So here's my journey as a bit of a literal journey across the world. And one thing you'll note is there's three different decades of time. Um, and I think about the things that I changed. So my first era is the 90s. I actually started in London. I went from UNC Chapel Hill to North Carolina all the way to London, England, and decided to do a startup. And in the 90s, we didn't call them startups. It was just a new company. And it seemed like there was a need to get involved in what was happening there, broadcasting, new media, Web 1.0. So we created a publishing business, and I wrote articles and collected data and really built an interesting career there. And I'm skipping some steps along the way but that I was building sort of the ability to work in new markets and figure out how to order furniture in strange places, and that the 90s enabled me to kind of grow and learn. As mobile became hotter than Web.0, I latched onto that. Again, opportunistic, trying to, to figure out how, how not to become obsolete. I took my game after 10 years and selling this startup back to the US, decided perhaps I need an MBA, maybe I can give myself a hand. But that all the while, I was actually realizing that there was some method to this madness, that there was almost five different levers that I was pulling. I was changing my role. I was an entrepreneur. I was a journalist. I was the chief administrative officer, meaning I bought furniture and desks. Um, I changed geographies. I was a 23-year-old American in London with the wrong accent. And optimism, that just wasn't done in London in the 90s. Uh, and different companies, big ones, little ones. And then lastly, industry. Hell, I didn't even stick with one single industry, I let the industries come to me. So what is the method? It turns out there might be a framework. Again, credit to Robert Frank. I'm not saying you could ever plan this as you went. But over the years, um, I kind of wound up in bigger companies. I was at Microsoft, and people would come into my office and say, I got this big career choice. I don't know what to do. And I'd invariably walk up to my whiteboard, and because I was a consultant at Deloitte, see, I'm going to get these little companies in there. I'd always go and do an XY diagram. And I will warn you, this will defy any X, Y, but I had to give it a shot. I said, you know, there's these five variables. There's depth, which is 
how you move up. Do you get promoted by level, take on increasing responsibility, make more money? That, those are depth moves. But there's also breadth moves. I could change industry. I could change company. I could change company type, big, small. And I can also change geography. Now, how much change can any career manage? Well, my career in the 90s had a lot of little companies, research assistant, journalist, uh, as I mentioned, startup. And then every so often, maybe I wasn't going to make more money, but I wanted to trade off a new skill. I'd take a step down. So as I'm kind of moving left to right across this journey, you can see I didn't give you all the names of every company here. I did have to put in the Cornell logo. I felt a certain obligation there. Because to be fair, the MBA created my first big pivot point, that I was writing about a lot of industries and technology and media. And I thought, gosh, I kind of want to do what these people I'm interviewing are doing. How hard could that possibly be? They earn a lot of money, and I don't. Um, let's change it up. But I, I took a spin after that and saying, look, I don't know what I want to do now with this MBA, but Variety Magazine needs a finance editor in New York. God, that sounds like fun. I get to go to parties. This would be interesting. Let's see, I could take a pay cut, won't be able to pay my business school loans, but I get to go to parties and write whatever I want about finance. Seemed like a fair deal. I probably made a decision most people wouldn't make because why would you go down on the scale? But for two years, I got to meet every executive I could possibly meet get my name out there and figure out when I would pay off my business school loans, which came when Deloitte came along and said, let's, let's make that shift. And I just use it as emblematic, because I think everyone in this room probably has a version of their career story that they tell in hindsight that starts saying, geez, all these pieces made sense. Deloitte needed me because I understood media. I understood media because I built a company in London in the media sector, but I didn't know anything about the US. Each time, I'm leveraging what I had to somebody who would pay for it so that I could learn the next thing, not knowing where it might go. And the, the curve underneath I think about is money and skills. In fact, it's a portfolio of options. That I didn't have one grand ambition of where any of this would lead me, but that each time I was sort of broadening the mix of things I knew how to do and could trade on to the next piece. So Deloitte leads me to Microsoft and Xbox. I knew nothing about gaming. I was probably the only female in many, many miles of the place. They sent me a box so I could learn how to do Gears of War. We had the Red Rings of Death right after that, first project and strategy, awesome. But boy, did I learn a lot. Then I met engineers. I got closer to software. I understood how product development worked, product management worked, leveraging, leveraging. Microsoft is one of those companies where you can actually have many careers in one company, and I exploited that. And each time, kind of moving along, take another step down. Direct TV, fascinating experience. Was it as senior as the role I left at Microsoft? Not necessarily, but it helped me leverage technology back into media. Now, you might say, how the heck do you get from Direct TV to Wanted Analytics, a data company that I just recently sold? Uh, nothing, only that I had had a whole career before that. That last little dot at the bottom, that's my current job. I'm juror number nine in LA Superior Court jury. I'm almost in contempt of court today, uh, but the judge agreed to give everybody on the jury a deliberation day off while I came here. Um, I earned $15 a day, so I kind of fell off the cliff there. But what I've learned about the criminal justice system the last five weeks is incredible. That is also something I will leverage. So I, I kind of finish up this section by saying, look, your career is the most strategic project you're ever gonna have. And I am a, a strategy person by, by historical, well, the greatest volume of jobs I've held. And that one of the signature elements of sort of this strategic project is comfort in embracing change and taking risks and allowing yourself to kind of go into this occasional pit of despair, the I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So when Jason said, I don't know how I got here, I said, I know exactly how you got there. And your background was perfect for what you wound up doing. It, it actually makes perfect sense because your willingness to, to jump in and try new things. And that these are starting to be hallmarks of, of kind of a very different way of thinking about leadership. And like any company, you have to do strategic planning. You just can't plan every piece. You can't say, I know exactly where I'm going in 20 years, and these are all the steps I'm going to take to get there. If you can do that, congratulations, you're better than me. I couldn't. But just know when to pivot, when to see something that might be worth the risk. So I thought, well, that, maybe I've got a theory. Maybe I just have a pretty two by two. It seems to make sense for me. Maybe it's instructive. Let's see if the experts have any data on what I seem to be experiencing. So um, Guy Berger, a PhD economist at LinkedIn, in fact, about a month or two ago, actually did a study in career paths 
They created a model, looked at, uh, I think it's like 350,000, may have the number wrong, consultants who'd started in the consulting space between a period of time in, the, in the, the, the knots, and determined that, in fact, people who changed roles more frequently and even changed companies more frequently did reach the C-suite faster. Now, this might not be a perfect example, but it was instructive. Now, he also said it helps to be in one of the big four cities and be male. Take that as you will, but I, I signaled in on the, the diversity piece that he noted. So then I went and asked CEB, Corporate Executive Board, the company that bought um, my last company, and they said, in fact, there is a lot of change in the system and that we're starting to see a need for a different kind of leader. So they had surveyed all of these executives and said, guess what? The most senior people in the company are already acknowledging that they can't keep up, that their jobs are changing more frequently, that they're asked to do more, that their jobs might change more frequently, and that that nimbleness was becoming a normal part of the, of the experience. Rapid, persistent, and sometimes dramatic change. So what they've been doing with this is saying, well, there's, there's already three kind, two kinds of leadership. They think about transactional leaders, um, great executors, and they think about transformative leaders, transformational leaders, if you will, who are great at you know, a radical shift over. But there's a new category that seems to be emerging that they're calling a network leader. And there were 16 competencies. I wouldn't list them all, but four jumped out that seemed to relate to this notion of, of needing change and uncertainty, ability to adapt, ability to embrace a new idea, not just have that new idea put upon you, and definitely an ability to work in ambiguity. Again, these are the hallmarks of entrepreneurial type people. You see something that's changed, and you could be scared, or as someone said this morning, you could run away from the mountain and say, I'm going to find a different mountain, or you can figure out how to solve it. That is an entrepreneurial style. But it's not just helpful for a startup in an entrepreneurial venture. It's helpful in, in any venture. Now, caveat here. Executive recruiters aren't necessarily there yet. They are still paid to make sure you conform as closely as possible to every job description looking for. But often the person who may have been exposed to many things is able to handle that risk. Um, so there's something that kind of came out of this, and yet two, two different kinds of, of animal. Uh, the generalist, and yes, that is the Monty Python, Minister of Silly Walks, because this actually comes from the British civil service notion of a, a generalist, um, good at a lot of things, versus a specialist. Now, the koala bear is a specialist. When the koala bear is in its narrow, perfect environment, living in the eucalyptus tree, eating this absolutely impossible to digest eucalyptus leaf, he thrives, she thrives. But if that ecosystem alters at all, extinct. But they're cuddly, they're cute, who doesn't like a koala bear? The raccoon? eats your garbage, but it can thrive in almost any environment. It's learned how to use tools. I would say you want to be a raccoon increasingly. Not everybody has to be a raccoon, but that raccoons bring a certain kind of benefit to the market. And that this need for generalists, um, I think it was described as knowing a lot about many, knowing a little bit about a lot of things as opposed to a lot about very few things. So I, I call it a post-industrial reality, that if persistent change and ambiguity and high turnover is the norm, what does that mean for how we, we should perform in it? And how can you think about a career as a, as a testing ground? Um, well, for one thing, I call myself the world's oldest millennial. And uh, you know, I graduated one year after Sally at UNC, and I got a bit of an inferiority complex, because when we looked at my graphic versus hers, she kind of went to CEO after like five years. And it took me like 15, 20 to get to the same place. But there's a, there's a parallel path there in that millennials, they say today, move around more. And that's not always a good thing. You don't just move to move's sake. But this notion that are you a, a freelancer, almost a free agent in the marketplace. And certainly in the Valley, you see this constant movement, not always a good thing, right? Stick around a while, build skills. And I think it's important for companies to recognize that that is the new norm. People will move around more. How do you allow them to stay by changing up what they can do in their role in this sort of free agent <coughs> market? At the same time, I think there are more paths to the top than ever before because a broader range of skills are needed, having marketing and product skills, having engineering and HR. You know, co different combinations are coming to the fore. So how do we, how do we start encouraging markets to see that? So while I wanted to, I was determined to do this whole thing in 15 minutes, and I may have even figured out how to do it faster, but these are my new rules. Don't get 
comfortable. And I got at least one former employee in here who I would never let get comfortable. Is it, it can be easy to stay around a long time in one company. I'm not criticizing you if you do, but they start liking you. You're good at it, and the better you are at it, the more you'll keep doing that thing. But if you're not careful, <coughs> you're gonna go very narrow. People want you for what you're good at. And that comfort may stop you from taking a risk that leads you into something you wouldn't normally do that builds, again, that optionality. The other thing I always tell people is don't get hung up on titles and try not to get too hung up on paychecks, at least in the short term. Willing to trade down, willing to trade laterally as opposed to always vertically, again, gives you more optionality. You'll get there in the end. I mean, it took me 15 years longer than Sally. I'm not resentful. I'm just saying it took me longer. Um, but what a great adventure I've had along the way. My other tip is there are no bad jobs. There's only a failure to leverage the experience. Like I said, I'm on jury duty five weeks now. I gotta go back and deliberate on Monday. It's killing me. But I've learned a lot. So never look at a job as that was a terrible job, made a mistake, no mistakes. Um, my other tip is don't worry about big overarching goals unless one of your, you're a person who can make that work for you. Small goals, small steps. Each goal will lead to the next. And like any startup company, be willing to pivot. Um, don't define yourself entirely around the thing you do. If you are a marketer in 1990, you probably became a digital marketer or an email marketer. Your entire profession has changed. Don't define yourself so, na so narrowly. Let Roll with those changes, embrace them, and, and let yourself be uncomfortable. That is my story.